Welcome back, everyone, to the Ankylosing Spondylitis Reduce Your Pain podcast. I'm your host, Sky Denton, and I'm stoked that you are here today. In today's episode, I again interview Peter Winslow, and I love having him on this show. It actually, it wasn't my, it wasn't my idea to have him on like every single interview, but we've just had so much fun, and I worked so closely with him to reclaim my life from chronic disease and ankylosing spondylitis that it just makes sense to keep having him on the show. And today's episode is fantastic. Again, we go pretty deep into some stuff that you probably don't think relates to AS until you hear us talk about it. Today's episode, we talk a little bit about the power of belief and the power of mindsets. And I give you one example. So say I'm holding two rocks. One rock is one of negativity and one is one of positivity. And I throw them both 180 degrees in different directions from each other. Well, here I am right in the middle, but I have a choice to walk down two different paths to each rock. One is one of negativity, victimization, disempowerment. That leads to a very different road than the one of positivity. That mindset right there and understanding that you have a choice in that mindset is really, really, really important. So I'm excited for you to listen to us talk about the power of mindsets today because it is something that is not spoken enough about in the world of health and wellness. We tend to think that all the solutions are outside of themselves, that the body is purely mechanical. But when we start to, to weave and interlace the appropriate mindset and the appropriate actions with appropriate movements in the body, healthy diets, healthy tools that we get from coaching, that is really how people create success. So you're going to hear us talk about mindsets today, and I'm excited for you to hear that. We're also going to talk about something very interesting called the law of identity. And this is probably not something you've heard of before. I was introduced to this by Peter Winslow, and it's also something that has been spoken about in places all over the planet for a very long time. So it's not specific to Peter, but what he's able to do is relate it to ankylosing spondylitis. And that, again, is why we are here. It's what we are talking about. This is the place of positivity for people with AS. And so understanding the law of identity is something you're going to get out of this next episode. And I will summarize a little bit more at the end of the episode on the law of identity and why it matters. Lastly, Peter talks a little bit about life purpose. I ask him a question and his answer goes right to the core of someone's life purpose. Now, this isn't what I was expecting him to say, but I want you to hear it because it's probably not what you think. What he talks about life purpose it's not a thing. It's not, it's not a career. It's not what I have sort of driven myself to do in life, of like create a life purpose and find my purpose. And uh, if you have a yes, this is going to relate to you in a way that will begin to invite you into a community of people that are reclaiming their life from pain and finding a, a, a life purpose, a feeling state in there that is motivating them to do really, really cool things with their lives, to give back to the planet, to continue healing their bodies, to continue letting go of pain, and to continue learning and coaching. So my friends, thank you for being here. I'm excited to bring this podcast to you today. Quick disclaimer, I am not a doctor and neither is Peter. We are health coaches, we are wellness coaches, we have both healed from ankylosing spondylitis through a process that is tried and true and has worked to a high degree of success for every single person that has ever really done it. So we speak from a place of, of optimism, of empowerment. And one reason that it's very, very cool for you guys to be listening to us is that we speak to you from a place of knowing what you are capable of. When someone comes to me that has a yes and they start talking with me, I already know that it's possible to reclaim your life to heal from this disease, for sure, like without a doubt. And so, and so does Peter. And so we're able to connect with the audience and speak to you all from a place of knowing that this outcome is also possible for you as well. 
So listen to that. Feel the energy of our conversations. Feel like the, the, the brotherhood and the friendship we have of, of bonding over ankylosing spondylitis, my time coaching with Peter, and the current classes that are being built and, and cultivated around mind-body wellness and reducing pain from ankylosing spondylitis. So my friends, thank you for listening. I'm going to get right to it, and I will see you on the other side of this conversation. All right, Peter Winslow, it's good seeing you again. How are you this afternoon? Hey, Skylar, it's good to be with you too. Yeah, I'm doing fine. Things are going really well, in fact. Thank you for asking. It's all cool. good, man. Life is good, yes? Life's great. Life's great. It's, it's springtime here in Wyoming, and that means the sun is out, the birds are coming back, <laughs> the grass is green and green, and it, it feels wonderful. Love is in the air. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Well, it's good seeing you again. Thank you for coming back. I'm going to jump right into something. This is kind of where we left off the last podcast. And I started talking about how refreshing it was to understand how simple healing can actually be and how refreshing it was to go from thinking I needed to understand the complexities of diet, um, exercise physiology, maybe how certain drugs were working in my body, and a lot of sort of very heady, complex things. And I was able to let a lot of that study go. And with my time with you, just focus on applying simple principles in my life. That's right. And did that work better for you? It worked, yes, absolutely. So much better. It's because of the simple uh, counterintuitive rule that the less we know, the more we have. So it's called minimalism in Eastern philosophies and so forth. But by trying to learn all about your disease, you just make it more real to the mind. And the more we learn, the less we heal. Mm -hmm. So that needs to be qualified because it's true to a point. We certainly want to know what's going on, you know, with the diagnosis or whatnot. But the more we study the illness, the more we look at what's wrong, the more we look at uh, how to combat that illness and what's wrong, the more fighting it takes to prevail. So people don't realize that there's a lot of counterintuitive principles when it comes to healing, because the first thing people don't realize is that the body heals itself. We don't heal the body. So if you have an intervention or a treatment of some sort, it can assist with the healing, but it's the healing principles in the body that repair the damage. So again, as I like to point out, if you break a bone, right, if you break your arm, you go and you get a treatment where they set the bone in place to where it can graft itself back together again. The osteoblastic cells knit themselves together and repair the damage. But it isn't the cast on the arm that does the healing. The setting of the bone is the treatment, but that leads to the healing in the body. The body heals itself when we get out of the way and allow it to do what it knows how to do best. So that's you know, not intuitive for most people. They don't realize that that's what's really happening. Our bodies know how to heal ourselves without us understanding how it works. So the more we study it and the more we look at what's wrong and the more we uh, analyze the disease and what's going on with that, the less we heal. So leave that to the analysts, leave that to the doctors, to the pharmaceutical uh, engineers and everybody else. Let them study the disease and the illness. If you have an illness or a condition that you'd like to supersede and heal from, you don't need to know more about the illness. You need to study more about healing. Good points. And one thing I just want to have the listeners really understand is what you said is the more you know about the disease, it might not actually benefit the situation. When I think back about me, I studied everything. I mean, literally the day after my diagnosis, that next morning, I was online and I was reading everything I could. And it was scary. And to your point, Peter, the more I read, the more I learned, the more I thought I knew about it the more real it got, the scarier it got, the more, the more permanent it became the more in my intense. psychology. Yeah. The more realistic, the more intense, and the more you were aware of the symptoms. You know, this is a phenomenon that happens in medical school all the time. They call it housemaid's knee. Housemaid's knee was a condition that uh, affected people who used to do the cleaning work in the households when they'd be on their hands and knees scrubbing the floors. And so that got transposed into the medical uh, vernacular 
because first year medical students after studying all the pathogens and all the illnesses that they could be exposed to and had to learn about, they felt like they came down with everything except housemaid's knee. It's like I got tuberculosis, I got cancer, I got blindness, I got Alzheimer's because they're studying it so profusely. Yeah. And looking at it and making it real. And wow, I've had that symptom before. Maybe I've got that condition. Everything but housemaid's knee. Huh. I've heard about that in medical school where doctors like, or soon to be doctors are studying all these different things. And they start thinking that they have all these diseases because some of the symptoms overlap. They don't really right. have it. They're just putting their focus there. You're completely ensconced in it all that while. And so it becomes real to the mind. Yeah. And the subconscious mind, it's important to note, doesn't know the difference between what is real and what's imagined. So if you imagine you're in a whole lot of danger and a whole lot of trouble, your body will respond in kind. You'll have stress hormones and other activators coming out into the bloodstream to prepare you for flight or fight or flight. And none of it's real. So that's why we have fun at scary movies, you know, in the movies when a ghost pops out, you know there's no real ghost there consciously, logically, but it scares you because the subconscious mind takes the bait. So, you know, then we reason later, that was just a movie, but some people have difficulty, like they'll have nightmares after watching a scary movie because the subconscious doesn't know what's real and what's imagined. So we can use that benefit to help ourselves. And that's, for instance, what hypnotherapists do. They, set, uh, they go to the subconscious mind and they set scenarios there that could be possible and the subconscious mind doesn't know if it's real or not. So it just acts upon the information and oftentimes people overcome their issues and heal from their uh, maladies. So it's quite useful and effective if you understand what, what we're dealing with here. Yeah. So what, what you put your consciousness to expands. What we focus on grows. And so if you're focused on the illness, in your mind, at least, the illness grows, and then the body follows the mind. So that's why I tell people, and with my system, the Winslow Way, we don't do that. We don't need to learn enough. I mean, we don't need to learn any more about the illness. We know enough about it already. What we need to learn about is healing and wholeness and happiness and joy and love and peace of mind. And that gives the cues to the subconscious mind and to the body to heal itself more appropriately and more accurately without the intervention of you know fear and phobia and pain and suffering yeah yeah one way i like to think about it is is study more of what you want study right. more of the outcome that you desire i know like for the years that i was in pain i might get online and look up some as chat group and what they were talking about was not was not what i wanted the prognosis that they were living out in their life the the pain so I studied things that seemed more positive. And it took me on a very circuitous route before I met you, but at least I was studying things that were positive. And you were really able to, to sort of seal the deal for me because you understood chronic pain, you understood ankylosing spondylitis, and you understood healing. And to your point, we don't study more about the disease that we don't want, we study healing. That's where we put our consciousness, and that's what grows. That's what we nurture and cultivate more of. That's what the Winslow Way is all about. That's right. And that's what I do in my life coaching practice as well, is show people how to focus on what they want instead of be afraid of what they don't want. And it transpires in all aspects of their lives. So we could talk more about that at some point where it's uh, relative to do so. However, it's true in our lives. What we focus on, we get. What we believe in, we create. What we look at expands. So if you want healing, you don't have to figure out how the body heals in order to do it. You simply have to get yourself in the right position to be able to assist the healing by getting your fears and phobias and thoughts out of the way and help having them work for you instead of against you. And a huge shift occurs at that point where everything changes. And then people say, wow, now my symptoms are easing up. So that's where we begin with the Winslow Way. Yeah. I like to relate it to sports. When I think of skiing or snowboarding or mountain biking, you know, if, if you look at the tree that you don't want to hit, <laughs> you're much you more likely right to, to actually hit the tree. And it's, it's a real thing. It's, you know, you focus on where you want to go and not where you don't because 
if I'm looking at that tree, gravity might be pulling me towards it. That's why I see it. I know I'm kind of headed towards it. But when I look at it and focus, it's much more likely that I'm going to, my body's going to follow my gaze and my head into the tree. I Absolutely. Can't... Yeah. And it's true in race, in, in uh, auto racing, where if, if those racers are really close to the wall, if they look at the wall, they'll hit the wall. Yeah. <laughs> so they got to look at where they want to go, not where they don't want to go. Yeah, exactly. So for all the listeners out there, really think about this because there are very few groups of people with ankylosing spondylitis on the planet that have a powering and a positive message. And, you know, Peter, we're two of the most positive people regarding AS on the planet. And so when people listen to this and put their focus into what we're talking about, it can change the trajectory of their life. It changes, it changes where they're going, what they're learning about, who they involve themselves with. And it's all so much more positive than sitting around talking about endless pain. It's life changing and life affirming, in fact. So this is correct that there's not many people with a positive message because they're looking at the problem and when the gloom sets in. So they tend to focus on that and then they commiserate. You know, they have misery together, commiserating with one another about how terrible and tragic it is. Actually, a wake-up call in their lives. Now, I had AS myself. I had the symptoms for 10 years, and then I healed myself from it. During that 10 years, I was one of those doom and gloom people too. It was terrible. I hated it. It was unfathomable what, what I had to deal with every day and every night, and it ended some of my relationships because I was too difficult to be around, and I lost a couple of jobs. And I mean, you yeah. know, it was tragedy and then I healed from it and then everything changed and I look back on it today I look back on it as the best thing that ever happened to me I'm so grateful that I went through that situation because now I can have compassion for people who are in that condition and I can lead them to salvation and, and healing so was it bad that I had AS or was it good that I had AS I don't tend to think in terms of bad or good I think in terms of action and consequence, and I went through the actions, and now the consequences are such that I can help people with the same malady the world around, the world over. Mm -hmm. So to me, what was the worst thing that ever happened to me became the best thing that ever happened to me. Yeah, and what a fascinating thing to say. Something that a lot of people with AS might have a hard time hearing, and I was the same way. I remember... Yes being so pissed off at AS. I remember being so angry. I was so <laughs> angry. I remember eating all, you know, only organic food and drinking my kombucha and eating blueberries and, and watching all my friends party and, and be athletes and do all the things. Good lives. Yeah. And I was like, I was so angry. And uh, ultimately I had a lot of reasons to be angry. Like I could justify all my anger but I realized it wasn't actually helping my situation. It wasn't actually getting my body healthier by holding on to that anger. But I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to let go of some of that until I found you. And that's what I teach people to do, of course. And so, you know, a lot of people say, well, how do you do that? And if you've got about eight hours to spend with me, I can show you how to do that. So, it isn't just a sound bite, unfortunately. I wish I could just snap my fingers and you'd understand what we're doing and how we're doing it. But essentially, the Winslow Way is a three-stage process. The first stage is to reverse the cause of your suffering. So now we go into the, you know, unpacking that uh, sentiment with how that works. And then the second stage is to repair the damage. And we do that scientifically. And then the third stage is to nurture your spirit which means learn to cultivate joy, love, and peace of mind. And those things are factors that lead you to happiness, health, wealth, and abundance. So we've got to pay attention to the body, the mind, and the spirit. And unfortunately, most people are just focused on the body and the problems in the body. And so they've been taught and they believe it's incurable. Because as long as you're looking at the body and the body only, you're not addressing the mental, the emotional, or the spiritual aspects of the human being. And there's no cure until you do. You can't reverse the cause without going into those meta models of human awareness. 
So when people ask, how do we do this and how does it work? They want to figure it out, right? They want to understand it before they're going to believe it. And that's counterintuitive. It's what you're looking at that expands. So if you say, I'll believe it when I see it, then you're skeptical. If you just turn that sentence around and that sentiment into, I'll see it when I believe it, that's how life works. If you believe something, you see evidence of it everywhere. Mm -hmm. So instead of, I'll believe it when I see it, it becomes, I'll see it when I believe it. Yeah. And that shifts the emotional standpoint by which all this operates. And it makes me think of the subconscious mind, which you brought up a few minutes ago. If someone is able to believe something and accept it, that's what their conscious mind is thinking about. And then that reinforces and speaks to the subconscious mind. So for me, I remember when I was working with you, there was a period of time where I, I felt like I had to see it to believe it. And you were helpful I, with that. I, I read books that described the science of epigenetics and I started understanding how cells actually work compared to the model that a lot of people, you know, think that the way cells work. And, but when I got to the place of where I could sort of drop all the needing to like see proof everywhere and just start working with you genuinely and applying the principles and just believing I was on the right path and believing that my body could come back into balance, those mindset shifts were difficult, but like once they were made, there's very fast progress that happened afterwards. Absolutely, because you change your beliefs. So if you have the belief that there's no cure for me and I'm a victim and there's nothing I can do about it, you're right. And if you shift that belief and say, well, I'm going to put my focus on healing and, and just being well and doing what healthy people do and focusing myself on love and light and what really lights me up and laughter and joy and all those things, then you'll see more of that. And it becomes like a snowball rolling down a mountain, larger and larger and larger and gaining more and more momentum. So that's what happens in my eight week course, you know, that you've been surveying the AS recovery challenge. We take people on that course from a little snowball to a huge snow boulder rolling down a, a hillside where the momentum is gained and then nothing is impossible to them because they realize that as they believe so they can achieve and the body just follows the mind. Especially when it comes to autoimmune conditions. Now, there's some science to know, like, you know, I had you do the reading, you, you read the Bruce Lipton, you read the other uh, teachers that I had you assigned to, and I give that to everybody to begin with so that we can overcome the skepticism. Because in Bruce Lipton's book, Biology of Belief, he talks about this exact thing, how the body follows the mind, and what you believe in is what you create in your body. Now, there's exceptions to everything, so you need to understand that it's not 100% belief-driven. There's also genetics and there's also behavior and there's also other things happening in the body. But we have to get all these things in alignment with a belief system that says, I can do this. My body is healing right now as we speak. And then act accordingly and conduct yourself accordingly. And that's when you'll notice the changes start to take place. And then you get that momentum started. And then as that momentum builds, the healing happens faster and faster as the body just takes care of business and does what it has to do. And you get all the pathogen uh, controls out of the way, which are your mind and your thoughts and your ego and all the rest of it, the victimization, the victimhood, the other uh, pathogens that exist in the body like bacteria or viruses or all the rest of that. You take care of stuff. And the momentum just continues to build. And people say, man, I feel great and I don't know why which is the best compliment to me because I know why. <laughs> I know why you feel great because we changed your belief system. Yeah. It led to a cascade of behaviors that are different in healing. So you, you just said a lot there. And I'm going to ask a question based on something you said a few minutes ago. And your answer might be a little redundant from what you just said, but you talked about you get to be right were the words. You said, if I believe that I'm a victim, that there's nothing I can do, that I'm going to live a life of pain, then I get to be right. And then you said, if I believe that I can take steps to better health, I can do different things, then I'm also right. So we talked just a little bit about kind of the mindsets or like what you mean by you get to be right, because so many of us were told that 
this is the way it is, this is the prognosis, this is how the disease plays out in the body. And we can be left feeling like we don't have a lot of choice. Well, that's certainly true. It all began for me with the uh, reading of the masters of American ingenuity. And one of those guys was Henry Ford from the Ford Motor Company, who at one time was the richest man in the world. And when interviewed uh, about his success, the interviewer asked him, when did you know you were successful? And he said, I always knew I was successful. Even though I went bankrupt a couple times, I always knew that I was a success. So as he believed, he eventually received and he gets to be right. And so he made the comment, he says, whether you believe you can or believe you cannot, either way, you're right. Yeah. So that's where that philosophy first came across my desk. And I realized what was going on with that. And that's been taught by every other ascended master and spiritual leader and teacher that comes to the planet. They all say, as you believe, so you receive, which is a quote from the book of Matthew in the Bible as well. So talking about the, the need to be right, that's an aspect that all human egos have. Every ego needs to be right. So if, for instance, you've always believed that two plus two equals three, and you're going through the world getting shortchanged everywhere you go, and then you learn the fact that two plus two is not three, it's actually four, two plus two equals four, now you can't believe the old limiting belief anymore because it's been superseded by a new belief. So you can't believe two plus two equals three anymore because the ego, and the, sub, the ego and the conscious mind have to be right. They have to believe in what it believes is right. So we look to leaders to tell us what's right and what isn't. And this is true with the medical community. We, we look to our doctors and talk to them about treatments and what's, what we're really dealing with, what's correct and what's not correct. And you're really getting their opinions. Doctors give opinions. That's why you get a second opinion when you're diagnosed with a condition. If you're smart, you get a second opinion. And as they're practicing medicine, you know, they're practicing on us, which is the way it works. That's right. That's the way it operates. So they look at us, they tend to look at us in subgroups and groups and uh, statistics. So the statistics are that 75% of people diagnosed with this condition are going to have XYZ as an outcome. It doesn't mean that the other 30% will, but as soon as we believe that we're in that 70 percentile, because that's most of the people in the study in the survey, then we acquiesce to that belief system and we become subservient to that person's opinion. And that's what's been happening in the medical community. People don't realize what you did when you went online to find answers when you were diagnosed with AS was what everybody does. We're trying to educate ourselves and learn what can be done and what we can do. And so people are looking for an external cure looking at some treatment or some plan of some sort that comes from beyond themselves, external to themselves, that will cure them. When the cure is within you, it's incurable, which means it's curable within you and only you as the body does the healing process. So if you don't believe this works and you don't believe it can happen, you're right. You're going to impede that progress and get the results that you're looking for in 70% or more of the cases. So people, again, are looking for an external cure when what they need to be doing is straightening out their internal environment. Okay. So that it becomes incurable, curable within. Okay, so we're talking about how powerful different mindsets are. I, so one metaphor I think of is, is say, say I'm standing in one place and I have two rocks in my hands. And one of them I throw in the direction of like perpetual anger and victimization. Right from one place, I chuck it that way. And the other one is a rock of empowerment and positivity. And I chuck it that way. Like those rocks are now very far apart, right? And I could walk either path. But so there are people in all different phases of the process of AS. And you're talking about belief and mindsets. For the people that are out there that are where I was with just researching, 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 and they stumble across this podcast, what is one belief you would like them to be aware of, to change? What, what, what's like the most broad belief system that you think that they could take that would help them? So my answer would be what's called the law of identity. And this is really the law of attraction made real. So the law of attraction, everybody's heard of is this airy-fairy thing that if you just think a thought, then it's going to come true and you can think yourself into the perfect relationship and perfect health and, you know, wealth and happiness and comfort all come from 
just that process. But here's what it really is. Here's the real law of attraction, and it's called the law of identity. And this is what I would have every person understand in their life who ever comes to me for any kind of consult or advice or counseling. The law of identity goes like this. In life, we do not get what we want. We get what we are. That's the law of attraction. Because the law of attraction assumes actually that you already have what you want and you're attracting more of it. It isn't to try to get something that you don't have. And that's what people are trying to do. They're trying to get healthy by acquiring something that they don't have. When if they understand the principle of the law of identity, we don't get what we want. Because if you want for a thing, if you want something, it means you don't have it. Once you get it, you no longer want for it, you've got it. You may still appreciate it, like, you know, I have a nice house and I appreciate it, but that's not wanting it. The want is taken care of by the acquisition of such. So if you're in a state of wanting, you don't get what you want because you're separating yourself subconsciously from that aspect. So we have to learn how to go from wanting to getting to having. And that's through being who we are. So we don't get what we want. We get what we are always and forever. It's so true in your life already. And if you're aware of this, you'll notice it in every aspect. This principle applies to everybody's life everywhere all the time. You get what you are. You're constantly getting what you are. Yeah. So now, how to understand that in terms of walking the path of healing and recovery and feeling better and being good? It's an inside job first. So I teach the skills and techniques to get there. Instead of just talking about the philosophy and discussing how it works, I give you the skills, like I gave you, the skills and the techniques to get yourself there so that you're being a state that's conducive to healing instead of conducive to victimhood and victimization. Because either way, if you believe you're a victim, you're right. If you believe you can heal from this thing, you're right. Mm -hmm. This isn't bone cancer. This isn't Alzheimer's. This is an autoimmune disorder, which means there's something within our bodies that's acting against itself. And that's what's, uh, that's what's in our way. And that's what we want to straighten out. And we don't do it by studying the illness. We do it by becoming whole and happy and healthy internally first. That's the law of attraction. That's the law of identity. We get what we are. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the, yeah it does. The law of identity is, is brilliant. And you're correct in that it's everywhere. It's playing out all the time with every single person, with everyone they involve themselves with. And it makes me think of um, your vibe attracts your tribe. Do you know yeah. that? And sure. so, I mean, so one example that the listeners, you know, I can, I can use them as an example. If they are into what we're saying, if they are feeling empowered if they are feeling positive by this this makes sense if this even makes sense to people yeah and they're on the right track yeah and they the law of identity in that example is is they're feeling some level of good they're feeling some level of confidence because that's what we hold in this conversation whereas someone who's very 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 victimized wouldn't quite catch on to what we're saying yet right people change all the time but that law for them is pulling them towards something else. We're always getting just what we are. Yeah. So if you're skeptical, you're going to get more reasons to be skeptical. Yeah. If you're loving, you're going to find more love. Yeah. If you're wealthy, you're going to accumulate more wealth. That's how it works. That's how it operates. We get what we are. So I know that this isn't meeting everybody where they are at this time because they're trying to understand it, comprehend it, figure it out, analyze it, see if it's true for them and if it works. Uh, for most people with AS, that's what they're doing as well. They're trying to figure it out, see what's going on, comprehend it. How can I get rid of it? What do I need to do? And all that stuff is resistance to what is. It's resisting what they're being. So... So let's use me as, as an example with this. As, you know, as I've heard you say before, my case of AS was extreme. And right. yet where I'm at now, I'm very healthy. I've been off all medications for pushing six years now. 
I've rebuilt my body. I'm healthy. People look at me and they hear my story and they're shocked. So in regards to the law of identity and you seeing my process of my time with you, without going into all the tools and everything that it takes coaching to really get there for, how did you see the law of identity shift in me to get I from where it. I was to where I am now? Okay, yeah. I've seen a shift in you for sure, Skylar. Because who you were when you first came to see me uh, in my office when we coached together, I don't even see that guy anymore. I'll take that as a compliment. <laughs> yeah, please. It's intended as such. You were worried and you were scared and you were frightened and you were disempowered and you were, you were doing your best, but it was over your head. And you'd, you'd gone to the best practitioners, from my recollection, for ankylosing spondylitis treatment in the world if not just in the United States. And yep. they kept focusing on the problem. They kept telling you to look at the problem and keep fighting it with uh, beliefs and behaviors and treatments that didn't help you. Perhaps there's a little help in there from time to time, but the overall trend was downward. And now your trending is completely the opposite of that. Who you are and what you're being is now inspired. And you've got a spiritual dharma that's come from this and you've got a purpose in the world that can help alleviate the suffering of thousands and thousands of people and that isn't who you were when i met you yeah which so you said something you said that i was on a, a downward trend and that a lot was over my head and i agree i was very in my head i was worried i was i was super concerned because of everything i had read about as of and course. that was that was it was a downward trend and like there's the caveat there and the but is that i was also hopeful that's what kept me searching and that's where i think the law of identity despite the downward trend and the concern and all that there was a spark of hope there was a spark of hope that was there that brought me to consistently looking for the positives the the people that had a message of positivity for me you being the one that was the icing on the cake with all the work I'd done for years of talking with people and everything. Um, but that hope is like what was nurtured, you know, kind of what at the end of what you just said, it's part of who I really was. I wasn't the concern. I was, I was more the hope. And that was the law of identity that was working for me. Yes. And I'm glad you brought that up because I do remember you being hopeful that I could help you, that there was a solution and there is an answer for you somewhere in the world and you were gonna find it. Yeah. So what happens is with evidence, the hope falls and it becomes trust. The hope what? Say that again. The hope evolves. Okay. And it becomes trust. So we no longer need to have hope for a better future. We trust in ourselves and in the process of life. And that changes everything. So then you, you, you raise your consciousness to a new level of awareness. You go from hoping to trusting to being. Yeah. 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 I remember, I remember getting on the conversations with you in the beginning. And what you talked about was just so different from what I had heard before. But, <laughs> but like that, that, that spark of hope inside me, that spark that just knew that I wasn't going to be in pain forever, just like grabbed onto what you were saying and, and wouldn't let go because I could just feel it, that there was a level of, of hope there. And then I got to know you a little bit better and trust you and your process more and more and more. And, uh, and now here you are. Yeah, right? You know, yeah. A short time later, here I am. <laughs> Feeling good, looking good, having life the way you would have it. Yeah. Yeah, I think I carry a level of gratitude with me that I think a lot of people don't comprehend because I know what it's like to be in so much pain. Obviously, you do too, but to not be able to walk and to not be able to eat what I want to eat and to literally crawl on the floor and pull myself up on the counters and now to be building things and coaching people and working outside, being able to move my body, it's an absolute blessing. 
it's something that is so invaluable. And so for the people listening, when they, you know, if there's even a, a spark of a spark of anything that lights up in their spirit when they hear this, then this kind of work is for them. This kind of conversation is for them. Definitely so. If they can relate to any of what we're talking about, then they're the right people and candidates for our process. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people are skeptical. They need more proof. They, they don't understand or don't believe it yet. And that's okay. We don't wish them any ill will. When they're ready, the solution is found. When the student is ready, the teacher appears. And one of the things I teach people to do is what you just mentioned, which is gratitude. Everybody's heard, okay, we're supposed to be grateful for what we have. And how do you be grateful for AS? I mean, it's darn near impossible to do so. And yet, in my coursework with the AS Recovery Challenge, I teach people how to do exactly that, and it heals them. Gratitude heals and brings more to be grateful for. That's the nature of the law of identity. If you're being grateful and you, you have gratitude, that's what you are as a grateful individual, then you attract more to be grateful for. And it snowballs, and it grows, and it develops. Mm -hmm. And by the end of our eight-week course, People have tremendous gratitude for me and for the process and for themselves and for life. And they recognize that they were called to this. And this was the wake up call indeed. Getting chronic illness and chronic pain was a wake up call, not a death sentence. Yeah. Yeah. And so gratitude helps tremendously with that process. Mm -hmm. So how do you do that? How do you be grateful for AS? Good question. Stay tuned and I'll give you the yeah yeah i mean we can we'll we'll go there who would uh, want to do that who would want to be grateful for as right and yet you are and i am yeah we just and, happen to be the people with no symptoms anymore yeah well and i think about your class and a natural thing that happens is they start to become grateful they like i i haven't seen them be exclusive things like recovering from pain and gratitude, like they tend to move together. Right. Yeah, yeah. That's how life works. And not only for something like AS, I, I think about uh, some of the specific people in your last class and they're becoming grateful for different things in their life. They're becoming grateful for quiet time. They're becoming, they're, they're tuning into nature more and more. The more they create peace of mind, and a relaxed body, the more their nervous system calms down with the tools that you give them, the more gratitude and feel good feelings just happen, which again, like to put that into healing terms, certainly helps the body heal. So you just said that uh, the more uh, gratitude they develop. And I want you to recognize what you're saying, because this is something that everybody wants to understand. You said when they create peace of mind, what I want people to understand is we don't have to create peace of mind. Everybody wants peace of mind and it's already within us. If you'd stop thinking, you'd have peace of mind, right? If I could give you a frontal lobotomy, you'd just be a happy camper. <laughs> yeah. Because you wouldn't remember anything that bothers you. So it's by default, when we remove all the things that bother us, all that's left, is joy and peace of mind. It's who we are, it's what we're being when we are being our highest function. And it's the same on the other side of the scale. People who are victims, nobody chooses to be a victim, nobody creates victimhood. It's by default that they fall into it and they don't know what to do. It's like falling into quicksand and then hating themselves for falling into the quicksand and the more they struggle against it, the deeper they sink into it. It's the same process. Would you rather sink into the dark quicksand or would you rather go into the opposite effect, which is love, joy, and peace of mind? Peace of mind, love, and joy are what we are spiritually. That's all that remains when you take away the cognitive function of the egoic mind. Mm -hmm. You just love, joy, and peace of mind. And the way that I know that is because I've felt it. I've been there. I've done it through meditation and contemplation and other practices of the spiritual nature where I learned that once I let go of ego or the thinking critical mind, and just let it operate on its own without my attachment to it, I just felt this tremendous peace of mind. And then everything got happy and funny, and I was laughing and I'm cracking up. And I'd look at a beautiful rose and crack up. 
because it was just so beautiful. I just laugh. Joy. Joy was pouring out of me. It wasn't something that I had to go get in life. I didn't have to qualify to be joyful. It's what we are already. So when I say we don't get what we want, we get what we, what we are. You can have love, joy, and peace of mind simply by being consistent with these uh, tools and techniques that we share to be able to clear your mind and your thoughts of the negative impacts of I'm a victim and I don't know what to do and I'm sinking in quicksand and there's no cure. Whichever way you roll that rock, like you said, if you roll the rock the one direction and you roll the other one the other direction, whichever way you follow is what you become. Mm -hmm. So there's an old Eskimo uh, aphorism that goes like that too. If I recall it, there's uh, uh, an elder in the Inuit tribe who said, I have two wolves in my in my mind, two wolves in my head. One is black and evil and mean and, and yeah. deadly. And the other one is white and protective and loving. Yeah. And they fight all the time. And so the, the tribe said, well, which one wins? And he said, the one I feed the most. Mm -hmm. Something like that. You remember that aphorism? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. It's so true, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. What we focus on, we get. So we've got, we've, got, we've got the wolf metaphor. We've got the quicksand. We've got the law of identity. So what my question for you, Peter, and this will be, uh, will give the listeners something to grab onto as, uh, as we close this podcast. Given what you said about the law of identity and how it's prevalent everywhere. And it's, it's so ingrained into what we get out of life and how we show up. The listeners now understand that and they're gonna start thinking about that in their own life. For them to get one step closer from being in constant pain to getting, for example, to where you and I are, what is one area that you would encourage them to become cognizant of in their life regarding the live identity? Does that question make sense? Yeah, I can answer that. And my answer would be their life purpose. It's the one thing to be aware of that will take them closer to the realization and awareness of the law of identity. Why were you born? What are you doing here? Are you just the person who came to use up resources and then you're gonna die? Are you gonna pollute the planet like a virus and just use, up, use it all up and never give anything back and then check out at the end of your life having never helped anybody. I'll never forget. My father said to me when I was 18 years old, he said, what have you done for mankind? And I'm thinking, what have I done for mankind? Hell, I'm 18 years old. You know, I just want to get a motorcycle and a girlfriend. <laughs> yeah. Oh, totally. That, that question has always stuck with me. It was so sage for me to realize later in life that that's what it's all about. And so I'm here to serve people in every way I can. That's my outer purpose. And so that's why I'm doing what I'm doing. And if I hadn't gone through AS and all that torture for 10 years with the chronic pain and the sciatica and the depression and the addiction to medications and alcohol and all the suffering that I went through and how it twisted my mind and led me to all these chasms of, of despair and addiction and depression and suicidal tendency. If I hadn't gone through all that stuff, how could I help people today mm -hmm. in the same way that I'm doing? I had to experience it for myself. And that's why everybody's going through their issues with chronic pain. They have to learn from it and experience it in a way that it informs who they are so they can let it go. And that's part of their life journey that leads them to their purpose. Now, if you ask people what a life purpose is, you're gonna get a lot of different answers. You know, you ask 10 people, you'll get 10 different answers. But essentially, your life purpose is to feel good. In whatever form that takes for you. And so to feel good and have that last, that lasting impression of being what we are instead of <clears throat> wanting what we don't have, we've gotta, serve others a lot of people would say well you know if i was just um feeling good about myself well i'm just going to eat pizza and birthday cake for dinner every day and 
I'm going to go to Disneyland every, every month and I'm just going to go indulge myself in whatever goes shopping or traveling or whatever they say. But then that wears off. And at some point it becomes evident and clear to people that the most meaningful aspects of our life purpose entail service to others. So when you can find a way to serve others that feels good to you, you've got it together. You're on your track. And that's what you're doing, Skyler. It's what I'm doing. Yeah. And it's it's what a lot of the people that come through the group class start to do. They all get inspired and they want to, like, they might not have any idea what their life purpose is in the beginning. Even that question could cause a lot of stress. Right. But as, as they start to reclaim their life from pain, everyone wants to give back. I don't know a single person that's either completely pain-free or even 10% pain-free, that's not super inspired at contributing, teaching, being part of this. And they can just, they can just feel the excitement and how useful this is for the entire planet. Every single one of them feels that. And most of them will say, I wanna scream this from the rooftops. I want people to know, I wanna help these people because they don't have to suffer anymore. Like yeah. me, they can be free. Yeah. And it's so inspiring. Everybody wants to coach it. They want to help. They want to do what they can do because they've been so touched by this process that has moved within them from suffering and pain into love and light and peace of mind, mm -hmm. symptom free. And it's like now their lives have totally changed for the better and they want to share it. Yeah. Have you noticed that about these people? Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. 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 And all we did was teach them a few fundamental ways to believe and behave. And their bodies came back into homeostasis. Right. Yeah. Which means the inflammation goes away. The sensation of pain goes away. Peace of mind comes to the surface. And it's a very different life for people. Complete 180, wouldn't you say? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm certainly not on a downward spiral anymore. <laughs> <laughs> no. No. <sighs> but you can be grateful that you had that, right? I can. Yeah, I mean, it, it was, for me, I think about it this way. I had some, a level of inner conflict in my life that meant I was very sad, I was angry, I was a people pleaser, I was a perfectionist, I was stressed out, I was battling myself a lot. My body really started to shut down and it woke me up that downward spiral, had it not been so painful, who knows where I would be. But because, well, if you of, that could... experience, because of that experience, I'm a much healthier individual now. Yeah, and if it weren't so bad that you could tolerate it, you wouldn't have made those changes and shifts in your life. Yeah. You'd have just gone on tolerating it and doing what you were doing. Yeah. So yes, a wake-up call indeed. It's a wake-up call for all of us. That's what I'd like people to realize. So who, what doctor tells them that? I mean, there's got to be somebody out there, right? There's got to be some medical practitioners who tell them this is a wake-up call to improve yourself and, and go in the direction that you were born to be. I don't know. I haven't met the medical practitioners who talk about that stuff. Yeah, yeah. I know one, Dr. Ron Peters. You met him or you went to one of his uh, presentations with me. Yeah. He talks about that. Yeah. He's not beholden to the pharmaceutical model of industry. Mm -hmm. He doesn't take insurance either. Yeah, he's a very smart man. I remember you took me to the presentation that he gave. And it was everything we were learning about. It was everything well, it was everything you were teaching me. And it, what was cool about it is it was quite science-based, which I loved because you know, language, the science is the language of our Western world to a large degree. And he not only had the wisdom and you know, being a doctor, but he, he understood healing and it was fun to go to that with you. Yeah. And that helped you overcome some of your skepticism or doubt about the science. For sure. Yeah. I'm like, wow, you know, like Peter's not the only one that knows this. There's like, there's people that understand the science and like, you've got the pain piece with AS, which is so, which is a keystone for people that have AS, but it, it was like, okay, there, there's science behind this. There, there are people that have other amazing stories of healing and, and Dr. Ron, very good guy. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. He's on it. 
Yeah. Bruce Lipton is another guy who understands this stuff as well. So there are people out there, but they don't get the lion's share of the attention when people are looking for a solution to AES. Mm -hmm. So they, you, that's why they find you. Mm -hmm. Find and me. You had mentioned Dr. Bruce Lipton and his work. His work was significant for me as well. To read that book while I was coaching with you gave me not only the science, but the tools, because the science really doesn't heal. Like we've talked about the body, the body knows the science, the body's it's the best pharmacist it's ever gonna have. But like, so someone can read that book and still not heal, right? Right. But it helps the ego, it helps the cognitive mind understand what's possible. You gave me the tools to actually apply in my life that created the different results in my body and in my mind. The book didn't do that. Right. The book helps people overcome their skepticism and to understand what's happening uh, at the biological level mm -hmm. because people don't believe it, right? They're taught not to believe it. They, and the reason for skepticism is because they don't want to be made a fool. Like I'm not going to buy a pig and a poke if it doesn't work. So they, they ask me, explain how the microbiology works. Mm -hmm. And I say, just read this book. Smarter guys than me have written this stuff. Guys with more credentials than I have are all over this stuff. Joe Dispenza, Dr. Joe Dispenza, he's another example of talks about this as well. Mm -hmm. So it's starting to make a momentum here. There's, at the forefront of our lives, there's a new way to experience health and healing that isn't just pharmaceutical. Mm -hmm. I mean, it would be great if we could just take a pill and get rich, right? I mean, <laughs> yeah, take a pill. Get happy. Get rich, get abs, and not have pain anymore. <laughs> yeah, I'd be I'd be selling that pill if it existed. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> there is no magic fairy dust, my friend. Yeah, but what I'm doing comes pretty close. Yeah, it's the closest thing I've found to magic fairy dust. You heard some of the people in this latest classroom saying superpowers. Give me more superpowers. Oh, totally. That's been a theme. That's been an ongoing theme for the last like three weeks in the class. Yeah. You know, You're and getting their superpowers. Totally right. That's and that's like it's fun to laugh about, but it's very real. They're realizing that they're not a victim. They're realizing how much they can do with their and life. their pain goes away and it drops off. And their yeah. symptoms just just evaporate and they're like you know this is like a magic wand yeah but it's not a magic wand yeah body follows the mind yeah it's yeah sometimes i like i think about some of the people we never see again right because they like they get over pain and then they leave i'm curious you know i'm curious about some of the people that were in the previous class i mean obviously they're doing really well like who knows what kind of superpowers they're creating in their life it's a brand new world for these guys yeah yeah so i hear from uh some of them from time to time and in fact we're putting together a mastermind support group for uh, people who've gone through the challenge you'll be hearing more about that in the coming uh, days so that we can all meet in one spot and compare and contrast our experiences and examples and lead the world to a better way of life mm -hmm. Yeah. So it doesn't take long. Yeah, it can be quick. All right. Yeah. All right, Peter. So our time's up. I'm going to give you the floor just to make any closing thoughts. Um, I'd like to know where people can find you and get involved in your current class and anything else you'd like to share. And I will follow up with a summary after you close out. All right, so the best way to uh, find out more about what I'm doing and how we're doing it is to go to asvictors.com. That's the central hub nucleus of my uh, online presence. There are other websites to visit from there that talk about the uh, AS Recovery Challenge and the AS Victors Club, which is a lot of resources, a lot of free resources, videos and audios and teachings and trainings that can help people overcome the issues that are hard to hard to deal with. ASVictors.com is the main hub to go to first and then go from there. And you can reach me there as well or at PeterWinslow.com, my life coaching practice. If you want to know more about what I call being super normal, 
and using your superpowers to experience anything you choose. If you can believe in it, you can have it. As you believe, so you receive. So tell me what you want and I'll show you how to get it. Okay, last question for you, Peter. What if someone's listening to this podcast and they have AS, but they have a sister that has Crohn's disease or they have a mom that has RA in her hands. Are those people welcome to go to the AS Victors site and sign up? Absolutely, it works for everybody. These are universal principles that I'm teaching. I've specialized though with ankylosing spondylitis because that's what I had. So this applies to all conditions and all situations in life. But I focused on AS because I had it myself. Cool, yeah. Well, yeah, and if I'll... you've got Crohn's, do you know Crohn's is the same uh, implicating genetics as AS? Yeah. You kill AB27, mm -hmm. which, 10 to 30% of people with an AS diagnosis don't have HLA-B27. Yeah. And only 2 or 3% of those people that do have it ever develop spondylitis. So clearly genetics is not the whole story. Yeah, definitely. Okay, Peter. Well, thank you for your time today. It's been awesome having you on the podcast. I personally have a bunch of notes and things that we're going to cover next time. Um, okay but for now i will close it out and i just want to tell you again thank you on behalf of myself and all the listeners well, you're quite welcome sky thank you for bringing this information to the world in such a marvelous way i thank you for being who you are and for including me in your process i'm really enjoying our time together and i would just say to you be well and do good man <laughs> cool that's the plan peter thanks man have a good day all right see you soon all right. Now, what a cool conversation, right? You can hear that Peter and I have such a unique take on ankylosing spondylitis, on chronic pain, and on the steps to get out of it. So how about the lie of identity, right? Can you, as someone who's listening to this podcast, start to look at where the lie of identity is impacting your life? I want you to really think about this until the next episode. So for the next two weeks, Really, really notice where the law of identity, identity is working in your favor or not. Some examples include, where are you allowing yourself to be a victim? Where are you allowing yourself to continually feel anger towards ankylosing spondylitis or someone around you or, or somewhere where you're just not feeling good? And think about this. Lots of times we don't realize we actually have a choice. The law of identity states that we don't get what we want, we get what we are. So the majority of people with AS, the majority of people with AS will be holding a mindset of victimization, of anger, of disempowerment, of sadness, of resentment, of being a victim of disease. That is why they're not healing from disease. The people that use the lie of identity for positive ways. I'll take myself for an example. This is a cool story. I went to the University of California in San Francisco and I spoke with Dr. Leanne Gensler. She was my head and still is my rheumatologist by choice. I, I, then I have one locally here in my hometown in Wyoming. But I remember being in her office and she's a fantastic doctor great advice. She had a physical therapist in there with me. She did everything really, really well. And I swore that when I left that doctor's office, the next time I was there, I would have healed from AS. I would not be in pain anymore. I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. Looking back, that was the lie of identity. I, my identity at the point was one of optimism. It was one of hope. At that point, it was mostly hope. <laughs> But I just knew deep inside that there were ways to get back to health, that there were ways to get back to wellness, that there were ways to bring the body back into homeostasis. That is what I learned from Peter Winslow. After my diagnosis with Leanne Genzer, I studied from very smart people for years, like three or four years. I did diets. I did all of these things. And no one hit on what Peter hits on 
which is the steps, you know, in what he calls the Winslow way. He talks about reversing the cause, repairing the damage, and then getting your, your spirit involved, like feeling good about life again so that you can keep on growing and moving in a healthy direction. No one hit on those until Peter did. And that's what the Winslow Way does. It gets people to that life purpose, like what we just talked about, of feeling good. Your life purpose is to feel good. And when you do that, when you learn to feel good, there's an art to it. The body comes back into balance on its own. We can understand the science and it helps, but it doesn't actually do the healing. What does the healing is our mindsets is the cascade of, of hormones, the biochemical reactions in our body. When we learn to become grateful for things in our life, when we become peacemakers, when we stop fighting everything else, when we stop striving, that's a big one that I really used to do, is I would strive so hard to prove myself out in the world, to be good enough. It made me a people pleaser. It made me resentful of others because I also wouldn't speak my mind because I wanted them to be happy and I didn't want to like piss people off. When we are trying to achieve so hard in the world around us, it can drive us bonkers. We can overthink things. Overthinking things causes stress in the body. So what my coaching does, what the Winslow Way coaching model does, is it gets people to feeling good. And we can learn to feel good. The head is out of the way. The body comes back into balance because it's always working with us and for us. We just have to start understanding what we're telling our bodies. <laughs> That's a big part of it. And to some of you that are moving along in this process, you'll understand that. For some of you that are brand new, you might think, well, what does it matter what I'm telling my body? Well, thoughts are the language of the brain. The language of the brain creates chemicals in the body, right? Emotions are the language of the body. Those chemicals create emotions. And all of that affects our expression of DNA. It either upregulates our genetic code, our immune system, or it downregulates our immune system. Well, it's not too hard to guess. Someone who's in more stress, their immune system's going to be impacted negatively. Someone who was in a lot of stress starts to learn how to feel good, change certain things about their lifestyle, the immune system's going to come up. When your immune system upregulates, whether you are doing it in any way, pain goes away because inflammation goes away. The body stops attacking itself. It doesn't need to. It, it, that energy, sort of, that confusion is gone and it gets back on track. The immune system gets back on track doing what it's meant to do. So, we covered a lot in this podcast today. Be aware of where you are becoming a victim, where your identity, where the law of identity is is you being a victim. And I want you to start changing that live identity and get yourself moving in a place of more positivity. Talk to me, talk to Peter, listen to this podcast over and over and over. And as you do, you're going to start feeling better. <laughs> That's just the way this works. Your body doesn't want to be in pain. And it's a waste of energy for it to be in pain. If I stop doing pull-ups, my muscles get smaller. Okay, the body doesn't need to hold on to that muscle mass. So it'll put energy elsewhere. Same goes with pain. Your immune system is on overdrive. It's costing a lot of, of metabolic <clears throat> energy from your body. It's very taxing on your body. And it doesn't want to be doing that. So listen to this podcast over and over. Talk with us. Implement the law of identity. And get yourself feeling a little bit better. And <clears throat> if there's just a shred, a thread of truth, in any of this conversation for you. I know it's true. And I'm speaking to you from a place of having healed from disease. But when something that you hear sparks something inside of your heart, when you feel it, when you're like, yeah, it's like, I don't know everything they're talking about, but it makes sense that if, if I did that, then my body would be in less pain. Then this kind of stuff is for you. And I congratulate you because you are ahead of the curve. About 3 million people in the United States alone with AS, the vast majority of them are sitting on the sidelines waiting for someone else to solve their problems. When you are ready to take your life into your hands and start feeling better, you do it through this podcast and through coaching. 
That is how it happens. So with that, I leave you with my best wishes. You can contact me at skydenton.com, and I definitely encourage you to do so. Reach out to me. See if you have any questions. If there's something you want covered on the podcast, let me know. You can find me on Facebook as well. And with that, I am out. I wish you all the very best, and I will see you very soon.